So now uh, our next presenter is Ed Nabrotsky, and Ed is EP of Sales and Product Development at Omni ID, and he's going to be uh, talking about uh, using RFID to improve efficiencies in transportation and manufacturing. Ed, you should have control of the PowerPoint now. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you all online for attending our webinar today. We're proud to sponsor it in partnership with RFID Journal. Uh, we find these webinars very valuable, and we hope you do as well. Uh, many of you online will know OmniID. Uh, for those of you that don't know us well, I'd love to give you a quick introduction. Uh, OmniID is the original patent holder and uh, innovator in harsh environment on metal tagging. Uh, we also are the uh, original patent holder and innovator in a new system called visual tagging, which we brought to the marketplace. Uh, Omni has a lot of experience in this in the last several years. Uh, we operate a global footprint with headquarters here in the United States, uh, as well as a small manufacturing site, research and operations center in the UK servicing our Central European region, our manufacturing facility and sales offices in China, as well as India, and many other agencies around the world. Um, so with our global footprint, we work with many wonderful partners uh, throughout the world. And in fact, that's one of our big focuses, as you heard from Pink this morning, partnering with leading software companies and integrators and other strategic companies. We're excited about pioneering and innovating RFID in the marketplace. I'm going to try and advance this slide. We're going to talk a little bit about supply chain management and cyclic processes. I'll use a couple of examples to highlight key points in a short time that I have with you. Our work with many partners around the world and the exciting part of our business <clears throat> is working with fun customers and applications that give us opportunities to, uh, to innovate in RFID. We've learned there are three key principles in optimizing these cyclic processes for supply chain management. Uh, the first is that the process has to be very simple. In fact, automatic is always the goal. I think Alex uh, highlighted that very well in his presentation, showing a drivable uh, vehicle going through a yard, automatically collecting the data with no operator interaction, no operator intervention. Uh, designing a system like that is really key, no matter which business you're in, to uh, aid in efficiencies, but also aid in the reliability of the data. That that simplicity means that there won't be opportunities to cheat the system or to put a burden on the operators who are trying to do a, a primary job function. The second uh, key point about this is that your system has to provide key data items to management. Clearly, the reason we apply RFID or any other system into our cyclic process is to get that data and mine it out of the process. We need that data to tune the triggers, uh, production triggers, supply triggers, the timing of those triggers, the timing of orders, um, and the quantities that are, are supplied. Many processes, even today, it surprises us continually as we get into applications, are operating blind and really have very, very little process data. As a result, um, the more we work with them, uh, we see inefficiencies, uh, over-ordering of materials, packaging, uh, longer lead times than are, are really required just because the data isn't there to tune the process. And the third key point is that your process design has to catch exceptions or problems early. Again, I think uh, Alex had a, a great point there in the question and answer session talking about that, that uh, sometimes tags don't get read or barcodes don't get scanned or, or things happen, uh, wrong goods show up. Uh, your process has to be robust and have uh, plans B, C, and D in place so that exceptions can be caught and remedied quickly in the process so that they don't flow downstream. We'll talk a little bit about how RFID achieves those goals as we go through a couple of application examples. I'd like to focus on two examples. The first is to talk about returnable transport items. Uh, this is a big focus for us, and we believe a, a core part of a lot of supply chain management that's using uh, harsh RFID tags. Um, when we talk about returnable transport items, we're talking about things that cycle through processes. These could be totes, you know, plastic or metal totes, uh, racks that uh, carry goods, containers such as cylinders or kegs, and of course the ever-present skids or lids that uh, carry different goods and, and pallets of, of goods throughout our processes. These are prime targets to be tagged um, with RFID. Uh, if you are using this in your process today and have often thought about uh, how to get efficiencies or how to get data out of your process, realize that RFID has come a long way. Uh, we can now tag any of these types of containers very reliably in a very robust manner. Uh, one of the advantages of hard tagging is that you can design a tag that will last as long as the container it's attached to. 
So each RTI shown in this picture and many other formats um, can have a, a reliable RFID tag attached to them that has an acceptable read range and a very acceptable life cycle to be able to provide reliable data in your process for a very inexpensive cost. One question we're often asked is, why can't I have one tag that, that suits all? Um, the famous magic tag question. Uh, the reality is that each container that you use or each RTI that you're using in your process has different characteristics. You're also filling it with different materials. So the best, best advice we always give customers is to really focus in on your, your process, focus in on the type of container you're using, and then test, test, test. Uh, we provide a lot of test and consulting services to make sure that the tag is optimal. In fact, we uh, house anechoic chambers in all of our regional facilities. And here in our headquarters, we have a, a very extensive uh, chamber lab as well as reader setups. And it's quite common for us to, for instance, operate a, a webcam uh, proof of concept for customers where we will tag a container similar to the one they're using or one that they ship us and uh, demonstrate to their process designers orientation, um, best read characteristics, and some of the, uh, the read fields that we get from our tags so they can understand how to design their process. So take your design uh, seriously and make sure that testing is a key part of your implementation. However, um, we do have tags and, and the market has um, emerged to a point where we can tag any RTI and tag it reliably and effectively for your process. So let's use a couple of examples and, and talk a little bit about how that works in the supply chain. One really good example is automotive assembly. Uh, automotive assembly is uh, famous for having RTI cycling between tiered suppliers through the supply chain. These RTIs are almost all of the ones that we showed on the previous page. Uh, they can be plastic totes, they can be metal racks, they can be different uh, types of skid um, arrangements. But in each case, these cycle continually back and forth between a, a tier one supplier and an assembly plant. Um, the labeling costs of that type of RTI cyclic process are very, very high. When you add them up over the years of the life of that um, model year or of that container, um, they're actually much higher than often the process designers really understand. Uh, the other cost that's high in that process is the tracking where it exists is largely manual. Uh, whether it's barcode scanning or good old paper and clipboard, um, there's either a high cost of manual intervention scanning at different places at the cross dock or at the supplier to verify shipments. Um, or there is a, a lack of information because that scanning is missed, especially when, when we're busy or when uh, things are a little bit stressful to meet deadlines or shipment dates. As a result, what we found in automotive assembly, and we've worked extensively in this area, um, that there's quite often two uh, large issues. One is a, a shrinkage or a loss or theft of the actual containers. Um, surprisingly, 20 to 30 percent is a very common number that we find in automotive assembly that uh, we lose or, or misplace or are frankly stolen each year of these types of containers or racks. Um, that is a very expensive proposition in the first place. Uh, but the second thing that's difficult is the lack of data. Um, many automotive processes today are running on a, on a Kanban style system, um, which is good in a lot of ways. The order is cut to the supplier and the supplier supplies the part, uh, which means that that's a, an automatic process, but we get very little data in between at the various sub-stages, and so it's difficult to optimize without some additional tracking uh, through RFID or another system. As a result, we're seeing now in this process early RFID tagging is beginning. Uh, we'd like to see the penetration a lot higher, but where it is employed, we're seeing tremendous benefits to having RFID tags on these automotive assembly totes and racks and uh, gathering the data required. A good example um, to share with you would be uh, Daimler AG in Berlin. Um, we worked with this customer in partnership with a, a key partner of ours, RB, IBM, to tag engine racks out of their uh, Berlin facility. Their uh, challenge is that each rack is crucial for transporting that engine you know, between facilities. Uh, they will typically ship uh, from Berlin to plants in Bremen or Sindelfingen or even in Tuscaloosa in the United States. Uh, as these racks go back and forth, either full with engines or empty, uh, they had very little way of tracking and, and understanding where the racks were prior to this RFID project. That uh, caused two big issues. The first is the rack itself was a valuable asset in the process. Um, this was not an inexpensive piece of packaging, a cardboard box. This was a significant assembly, and their shrinkage was fairly high. Uh, the second part, um, and probably more crucial to them, was that missing racks caused delay in their process, 
they really couldn't ship an engine without a rack. And through different ebb and flow in the process, they would sometimes be short of a particular type of rack to house a particular type of engine. And this caused uncertainty and failures on some quality metrics that they were looking at occasionally. Um, so it was key to them that they implement some kind of tracking to get visibility into their process. Uh, as a result, again, in partnership uh, with IBM and, and with Omni ID, we studied their implementation. We worked together to uh, tag these racks, put up a full automated gate and reader system outside the crucial plants so that we knew uh, racks coming in and out, both full and empty, and they implemented a global software platform to be able to track these racks. Um, the project was tremendously successful, and uh, as, as per the quote on the slide, they achieved the certainty they were looking for, that now they could plan production, they knew where their racks were at any given time, um, and they were able to know that they'd be able to ship engines on time uh, as, as uh, the process demanded. Another good example um, that I wanted to share today, especially uh, having had Pink uh, present earlier, is mobile device logistics. Um, we deal a lot, not just in RTIs, but with different types of mobile devices. These could be carts, different lifts, trolleys. Certainly we're doing a lot now with medical equipment, you know, whether it's uh, large medical devices or even rolling wheelchairs and, or gurneys. Um, and certainly with trucks, you know, tugs and forklifts, as we talked about earlier. Now, mobile equipment, by its very nature being mobile, requires some kind of automated tracking system to keep track of it. The return on asset numbers can be really appealing if you can get your system right because these assets typically are very expensive and they can range over a fairly large area. So uh, mobile uh, device logistics is a key theme for us as well. An example to share that's uh, maybe a little bit different but illustrates the point is the United States Marine Corps. Uh, we've been working for quite a while with the, the Marine Corps on figuring out how to take care of their rolling asset logistics. Uh, you can appreciate that the Marines are a massive organization. Um, they have a tremendous uh, amount of uh, rolling assets, and their whole mantra is to be able to deploy quickly. Uh, when they're needed somewhere in the world, they need to be able to roll out and roll in very, very fast with a great deal of certainty, you know, bring the right weapons to bear and the right uh, vehicles and equipment to bear. Um, without uh, good, reliable automated tracking, they really can't implement their mission. Um, the particular challenge recently that we've been working with them on is their rolling stock returning from Afghanistan. Uh, you can appreciate the amount of assets that are deployed there that are currently making the cycle back from Camp Levenek uh, to the Blount Island Command. Uh, they'll have large marshalling yards, sometimes 450 acres or more, um, that they have to take inventory on to know what trucks, what equipment are there in those marshalling yards. And without that certainty of understanding where they are, they have difficulty in deployment and deploying reliably. So we've worked together with them uh, on a system of uh, rapid deploying RFID. Uh, I'm showing you a picture here uh, from one of the deployment yards. Um, because of them being the Marine Corps and being mobile as part of their mission, uh, their reader system was built on solar-powered readers that could be deployed easily, even in a desert or remote condition, um, picking up a tag that would be hard-mounted uh, onto their vehicle, onto their asset, and being able to read that into uh, a database and upload it securely so they would know their, the state of their equipment anywhere that they, they went. Um, in their case, each vehicle, uh, no matter which type of vehicle it was, was double tagged. Their two main use cases were first this type of a reading scenario. Uh, and there were several reading scenarios. Uh, one is this gate style, you know, typical land-based application. They have a mobile reader, of course, that can be uh, mounted in the sand on a beach as stock comes directly off of there. And they have a dock-mounted type reader system as well. But in each case, it's a mobile quick setup style reader. Um, the two tags that are deployed, the one is on the side of the vehicle to catch from one of those mobile preset readers um, to be able to record the asset as it goes in and out. But the second use case is when it's in inventory. Uh, much as we saw in the earlier example on this webinar, uh, having a mobile a truck unit with a reader mounted in the bed of the truck or on the side of the cart, as it drives through that 450-acre site, being able to pick up a tag on the front plate of the vehicle um, so that we can, we can take inventory of standing vehicles in a marshalling yard um, or in a staged yard. This type of system allowed them to do check-in and check-out fully automated. And uh, the key use case here was not as it was in the manufacturing case of trying to reduce shrinkage or trying to have certainty for containers for production. Here it's all about rapid deployment, being able to get in and out faster with a greater certainty of knowing exactly what equipment you have in theater and uh, what equipment still needs to be found and, and brought to the ship or brought to the dock. Um, some of the key factors here in this application, uh, the on-metal tag performance, of course, is critical. In their case, everything we're tagging is metal, and in fact, really heavy metal. 
Uh, so having a tag that's optimized for that is key. Uh, read ranges of about 50 feet uh, without batteries, as we've mentioned, uh, is really crucial for them. Uh, obviously, battery performance was a major concern and a source of failures in systems they've used in the past. So having a completely passive tag that could read on metal at 50 feet um, was a, a great innovation for them and uh, enabled the application. But past that basic performance, there was severe durability uh, that had to be overcome. Um, we had to uh, test against uh, you know, sandstorm, sandblasting style type environment that can be really rugged. And of course, specialized paints that would be used, adhesives that would, uh, would bond correctly. So when we design a tag, there's a lot of factors to make that truly reliable for the application. That was certainly the case here. As per the, uh, the quote, you know, expecting to achieve the 50 to 75 percent increase in throughput, uh, actually they've achieved even better than that in some of the early implementation that's been done. And we're excited to watch as that continues to evolve as all their assets are tagged uh, coming back from the more recent deployment the increased um, flexibility this will give the Marine Corps as they track their equipment. So in general, um, through only a couple of examples, I hope we've demonstrated that RFID can truly provide that automatic data collection and distribution that, that we look for in these applications. The fact that you can do no touch tracking, uh, generate messages and events to key managers that are managing the supply chain is a key piece of all the systems that we participate in. Uh, we work closely with our software partners to make sure that the software layer over top of our tag and hardware systems can work well for the customer and the application and provide the, the type of data that they need in real time. Security and ruggedness, uh, a previous concern of RFID in the early days, really isn't a concern today. We can make tags that are, are rugged for any environment, whether they're high temperature, whether they're uh, harsh duty. And security has also advanced quite a bit, whether it's electrically tethering them to objects for uh, removal detection, whether it is security encryption of the data, uh, all of that is now stable technology and available to the market. And lastly, operator signals interaction. Uh, again, a new area that we didn't talk about as much in this particular theme, but being able to show uh, operators real time on the floor, in the theater, exactly the status of an asset is a key uh, piece of RFID today, whether it's through uh, associated devices like handhelds or tablets or whether it is through a visual tagging system, uh, such as the ones that we deploy now uh, to show signals directly on the asset. Uh, Real-time interaction with operators is a key piece of the system today as well. And with that, I'd love to take your questions on any of the applications or general tagging concerns that anyone has. OK, uh, thank you very much. So folks, um, if, you, if you have uh, any questions for Ed, uh, type them into the uh, Q&A tool on your tool palette and uh, again they will be queued up for me and I will present uh, present them to Ed. So uh, Ed, do, do people um, generally purchase tags from you and software from companies like Pink and others or um, do, do you work hand in glove with companies like Pink? How does How is that relationship managed? And, pardon me. At this stage in the market, what actually is most common that we, we find in 90% uh, probably of the projects we get involved in, um, someone in an enterprise is looking at deploying RFID and they usually contact us first. Uh, in contacting us first, they're concerned about can I tag something, what kind of read range can I get, uh, will it fit my particular application, metal on metal. And we usually start talking with them directly and then we find a partner either in their geography or in their industry that can service them. Uh, if it was yard management, for instance, Pink would be our first phone call, and we would uh, we would start working together, usually in conjunction. Um, everything is so interrelated. You know, the reader architecture, the tag, the actual application use case that we usually work fairly closely with the customer, the partner, and our designers at, at Omni ID to create a system that really works. And that's the most effective way to make sure that you've got something that works. All right. We had a um, couple of questions when. Um, Alex was speaking about cost of tags and number of tags used. And um, I, I wonder if you can comment how important or how uh, significant is tag cost to uh, the overall cost of the system and uh, you know, the, the potential return on investment? Certainly. Um, of course, in, in passive RFID, most of the applications that we receive calls about are high volumes of assets um, where cost is obviously very critical. 
Uh, for an active tagging system, you know, the numbers are much smaller per asset, and that's why you have a more expensive tag and, and a less expensive infrastructure. So cost is usually very crucial. Um, one of the, the big differences in the market today is that because we're now getting up to you know, million plus asset applications routinely in our passive tagging cycle that um, when you contact us about an application, we will probably take from a platform design and spin something that's optimized specifically for your application and for your cost target. How rugged does it really have to be? How much read range do you really need? Um, is the orientation important so that we can tune it maybe for a single direction read? In doing that, we can really take out the pennies and the nickels and the dimes to make it effective for a, a 1 million, 2 million, 3 million tag type uh, application and, and bring it to a cost point that's, that's reasonable. Um, even in hard tags today, you know, getting down to a, a dollar a tag is, is not, um, is certainly something you should be thinking of if you've got a high volume uh, tagging opportunity. Right, okay. Um, how secure is the data on the tag? It's, a, it's very secure. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a, a couple of different ways to secure data on the tag. Um, in standard form, um, most applications you want the data to be easily read, so you use an EPC standard uh, so that any reader can pick it up. But there are encryption algorithms that you can use to encrypt that data and make it so that anyone who tries to read it will not get any, any intelligible information from it. Um, that's just from the tag uh, data perspective. Security on the tag also can mean uh, often, as we mentioned, detachment alarms or, or the ability to be secure in, in burning a permanent ID that can't be rewritten, uh, which is also, of course, very possible and is done quite often. Okay. Uh, in the Marine case, you said that they put two tags on each asset. Do these tags have the same ID, and what is the purpose of that? Yeah, in their case, they, they did want to have twin tags so that they could read from different orientation. Um, and the purpose was that, uh, as I mentioned, the two use cases, one was a drive-by use case where the side mount was most effective. They were trying to get maximum distance. Um, you can appreciate that if you're driving vehicles off a, off a ship onto a beach, they didn't want to necessarily have to constrain uh, that a reader would be right beside the vehicle. They wanted to have, as I mentioned, about 50 feet of distance. And so to optimize that, it was best to present that tag in a consistent surface, which would be the side of the vehicle towards the reader on the beach. Um, so choosing a second tag location allowed them then to satisfy the other use case, which would be tightly packing these vehicles side by side uh, when all these vehicles are made out of very heavy gauge metal and having a tag on the front presentation so you could drive through a yard, again, at a decent distance and pick up each, uh, each vehicle or each asset as you drove around through the marshalling yard. So uh, the two-tag orientation just solved that problem. Uh, would it be possible that we create a much more expensive super tag that would read in both orientations very effectively? Uh, with a good mounting strategy, maybe a bit of a, a curvature or protrusion. We've actually made a tag like that for a different use case for the military, um, but in this case, it was more cost effective to use two tags that were simple tags and mount them on the two surfaces. Right. Do you have a solution for steel rolls? If you have it, which Omni ID part number is it? <laughs> That's a great, uh, great question. Um, I'm not sure I can quote you a part number uh, off the top of my head. We've tagged a lot of steel rolls, actually, um, and so I, I know we've used different tags in the orientation. It depends on if your steel roll tag, again, is on the axis or whether it's going to be a tether-style tag or a bandit tag. Um, whoever had given that question, I'd encourage you to call in to our inside sales desk, and we'd be happy to answer that specifically and, and with more information, give you the exact part number for your needs. Okay. Um, on one slide, there was a note, labeling costs are high, automotive example. Can you be more specific about why labeling would be expensive? Absolutely. Um, so uh, an example we've used before, um, we, had a, we had a plant that was printing 120,000 labels a day uh, just for labeling their, their RTIs. Uh, the cost of all the, the paper, the consumables, the toner, the maintenance of those printers, that alone was a really big number once they really looked at it and saw how often they were printing these different labels. But the second part was the labor of actually picking them and placing them. And on average, they were barcode scanning those tags about six to eight times in their process, uh, right from the supplier who was out checking them through the, the cross dock, the shipping, and then re receiving lanes and, and line site addresses. So the true cost of labeling was not only the paper and toner and maintenance of that, but the humans to place it scan it and, and go look and read those cards. 
Um, so when we added that up, um, it very quickly opened the eyes of, of supply chain managers to the value of automated RFID, which is no touch, no consumables, and no operator interaction uh, to be able to read those through the process. Okay. Do the solar-powered readers have a backup power supply? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, in their case, they did have some uh, battery units, and the status of those battery units was transmitted regularly as a polling function to the software, so they would know if the battery was starting to fail, but they would recharge from the solar power as well. Right. Okay. Uh, Ed, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for your support for this webinar. Um, as, uh, as you can see on Ed's slide, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps will be presenting at RFID Journal Live on, on May 1, and of course uh, OmniID will be there as an exhibitor. So uh, thank you very much, Ed. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark.